Uh, well, hello before, um, hello everybody. Uh, before I start, I want you to, uh, to know that this is not a technical talk. Uh, I'm a computational linguist, so I prepare the data. Uh, I pre-process the data uh, for modeling later. So this is a practical approach on how to, um, how to prepare and how to pre-process data in order to be able to use it uh, when modeling. So uh, just for you to know. Um, I'm a computational linguist, as she said. Uh, what you need first um, for this recipe, you need to gather the corpus, then you pre-process it, then you do the text modeling, and then uh, uh, I'm going to uh, tell you about the pros and cons of supervised learning. So um, I'm going to talk about pre-processing in uh, social media, pre-processing text. So we need to know first what social media is. And basically, uh, there are four, um, four uh, um, things that you need to take into account. First, it needs to be web-based app. Uh, also, it needs to be user-generated content. Uh, users uh, must be able to create profiles and to be able to connect with other users. And uh, with this, we uh, have the development of social networks, which are basically social media. So what is social media? Uh, with the definition we had before, uh, we can uh, think of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Pinterest maybe, LinkedIn, but also Amazon, because uh, in Amazon you have a lot of content reviews, booking, the same, TripAdvisor, and also Wikipedia, if we think as a content uh, uh, site where you can share uh, ideas. So the type of content we find in social media is text, as in Twitter, for instance, or any other um, web-based application. Also, um, Instagram with images, videos in YouTube, for instance, or Vimeo. Uh, then the step for text analysis, as I said before, I, are those there. And we start with gathering the corpus. To gather the corpus, sorry, uh, you can uh, take uh, corpora from online free sources or from web scrapping. Th those are the two main basic uh, places where you can find data. So online free corpora, you have this, this corpora there. And for instance, you have... Um, the first one, it's not working, oh yeah. So you can type import NLTK, I know. Uh, no, because it's a video, but you don't need to, I'm not writing any code. Um, you, you, you write uh, NLTK.download, and then you get uh, this uh, user graphic interface where you can download all the data, okay? It's just uh, so that you know the, the tools that you have. I'm not coding, but um, if, you, if you have a look at this, you can download a lot of packages which are really useful uh, when starting, especially doing uh, NLP-based applications because they're really useful uh, because they have labels, they have uh, a lot of um, resources that are really useful for starters. Also, uh, the big... Um, uh, uh, young University, they have a really good corpora in English, also in Spanish and Portuguese, but um, any other languages are difficult to find. Um, the British National Corpus, uh, you, ca you can access the corpora or you can download it. And uh, there's this guy called uh, Martin Weiser, and he also has a really good corpora of online uh, English. And he's got really good uh, resources there too. And then you can do the web scrapping of social media and information resources. Social media, you know that, is Facebook, Twitter, whatever. And then the information resources, in my case, for instance, I did um, a script that was able, able to retrieve uh, information from the Spanish Academia uh, webpage. And it was useful because I needed to check whether a list of words were, um, d do really exist or not in the Spanish academia, and I could do it automatically. So it was really helpful. So the kind of text we find in social media are the ones that um, 
are a tricky ones uh, for some reasons I'll tell you later, but um, it determines the way we're going to analyze uh, the data. So we have posts, we have tweets, we have those tags and comments in the posts. I mean, you see there's a lot of comments. And uh, in the tweets, you can also have the hashtags. All of these information are really valuable information for text analysis because they will, uh, all those um, tags and comments and whatever are going to be really helpful when organizing and classifying text and all these tasks we're going to perform. So now we, now we have the corpus and we need to go to pre-processing. When pre-processing, you can do a lot of tasks, but I'm going to explain those three uh, because they are the main important one and also the, the most useful ones. Tokenization is separating uh, a text into smaller units. So you can separate into sentences or words or whatever unit you need. And you might think this is very easy, apparently, but you might uh, find some examples like those, like City of Bombay, you don't you have to decide whether you want to keep this as a whole unit or you want to, to separate each word as a separate unit. So this is uh, a lot of work you need to think about before you do the, the, the processing. Also, you will have problems such as uh, ex-Malaysian prime minister. You need to decide whether you want to keep those units as one unit or separate ones. So this is it. Um, also, want and, and theirs, you need to decide whether you want to keep the verb and the negative uh, form or you, want, um, or you want to separate them, because especially the negatives are tricky uh, when sentiment analysis, uh, text analysis, so uh, all of these you need to think about beforehand so that you can have the proper data you need. Also, it depends on the language. It's not only based on the text itself, but the language. Uh, you see, Japanese and Chinese used to write uh, everything together, so they, you cannot use spaces as word breakers. And especially Japanese has also uh, those four alphabets. So it's not that easy to decide uh, which one of the tokens are you going to separate. Uh, so word removal is pretty good also for removing uh, words that are meaningless. In the case of uh, pronouns or um, determiners, possessives, uh, I know you, you can't read those, uh, but um, it's basically a list of words you want to remove from your text uh, because it, it will be uh, noise in your algorithms, uh, in your models. So it, it's very useful to have a list of words you don't need. And finally, lemmatization and stemming are useful because uh, you can group lemmas uh, be better than if you have uh, all these inflectional endings uh, that are also noise. So for instance, lemmatization is to remove inflectional endings but coming back to the lemma, the original lemma. So in this case, you will basically need a dictionary or a set of rules that um, help you to uh, go back from the um, uh, inflectional ending, I mean the word with inflectional ending, for instance in smiling, to smile. So you need or the set of rules or the dictionary to go back to the, the lemma, which is smile. Stemming is easier because you, ju you just chop off word endings, so um, you don't need to do, uh, you, you don't need uh, the dictionary. You can only chop off the endings, have a, a small list of endings, and then you chop off and it's over. So what are the problems we find in text with so in social media? Basically, the, mess the most important one is time sensitivity. As you know, Twitter, Facebook, and Amazon, or Amazon reviews, I mean, and all of these sites have content which is dynamic. It means that it's constantly changing, people are constantly creating new content, and it's really difficult to build a model because um, you, you cannot decide on a, a set of parameters and expect it to work because parameters are constantly changing. So um, this is a, the main problem we have in, in social, uh, social media when analyzing the text. Also the short lengths. Um, if you try to analyze Twitter, you'll see that you have, for instance, um, I don't know, Superman and Clark Kent, 
and you know that they are the same person, but you might have a Twitter on, some, on one name and a Twitter about the other name. So when you come to uh, cluster those words in, into different groups, you'll see that they might not be related in the same cluster because there's no contextual information that is telling you they are the same person. So it's difficult. Uh, the, this is a problem. Um, for text analysis. And this brings you to the semantic gap, which is exactly what I just explained. Also, the problem of unstructured data. There's two uh, variants. First, the variance of, tech, of content quality. You see there's people that write really good in a really polite manner, but then there's people who write uh, the way uh, words come out of their, uh, their mind, and they don't try to make sense of the sentences. So this is a problem. And also, acronyms abbreviations like you or two in this case or the and and the mis the misspellings like where is a is a word but how do you distinguish where from we are so all of these uh, problems you'll find in text analysis a lot and also you have uh, abundant information there's tons of data and you need to cut somewhere in order to be able to process so applications in real world uh, you can use uh, all those uh, strategies for event detection, for instance, um, to know what is a, um, a new which is very famous or which is popular, or to predict what kind of information is going to be fashion in the next week or whatever. Also, you can take advantage of collaborative uh, question and answering in sites like um, Stack Overflow, for instance. If you scrap the web, uh, you will be able to find a really important information and a specific one, rather than if you Google uh, your search. Also, you can uh, use Wikipedia to fill in the semantic gap I was talking about before. If you use Wikipedia, which is a trustful resource, uh, you might be able to um, to create somehow relations between those words that are apparently uh, non-related, but with Wikipedia, you find relations of the two. It's also useful for sentiment analysis. I will put an example later. And also to identify influencers and see if there are a lot uh, of mentions of that person, or also uh, for review quality prediction. Like in Amazon, you might want to know if a review is faithful or not, and it's very useful, uh, these kind of uh, tasks you can perform uh, with NLP to decide whether uh, to trust that uh, user or not. So now we're going to uh, go through text modeling. I'm, I'm going to uh, go through it very quick because I'm not an expert. But um, with this pre-processing we did, we should be able to uh, come up with uh, a proper way to, uh, I mean, proper uh, data set to be able to perform this. So uh, if you go to Amazon and you find those reviews, you might want to separate, well, they already do, but uh, if you have your own page, you might want to um, separate between positive and negative comments. So uh, to find positive and, and, and negative comments, you need Here. You need um, a vocabulary of positive words, negative words, and neutral words. Okay, so if we go back to these, um, you first need to define the task. You want, uh, maybe you want to group the words in clusters, and you need to decide which kind of clusters you want. So once we have the task defined, we need to decide the strategy, we, uh, strategy we're going to use for sentiment recognition. There's mainly two ways, the supervised and unsupervised. But uh, unsupervised learning in this case, it's really, really difficult. So the supervised learning, you will need a labeled corpora, which is um, time consuming, predefined categories, and you need to go all through the data before you decide on the categories, and you can use sentiment lexicons. For unsupervised learning, you will use an unlabeled corpora, which is easy. Uh, you can use k-means for category discovery, which is also use, useful, but you'll have the problem I said before with the time, because it's constantly changing, so um, you never know if your model will be properly good. 
As I said before, we need a list of vocabulary for positive, negative, and neutral, and also you need a, a list of comments you want to analyze. The result, this is a, ve a very basic algorithm, algorithm for, uh, this is naive base, but um, I mean, you can use any one you want. Uh, the, the input will be mostly always the same. So the result you'll get is uh, generally a positive score and a negative score, and then you can uh, classify uh, the text depending on, on the result you get. This is a very basic task. Um, in my opinion, the best way is using sentiment lexicons because you have a word list of positive and a word list of negative um, words and um, it's a binary fashion, so it's a, an easy text classification task. Um, the problem is, well, uh, sorry, these are two really good ones. Also, you have WordNet for, NL, um, from, for NLP, and you can download uh, WordNet in, in Python, and it's very useful. I'll, I'll add the link after if you want. But those are really simple ones, and they come with this binary fashion uh, already um, classified, so it's pretty useful. Um, another approach, which I thought it was really interesting, although it's not that, um, it's not that new, but it's a really interesting approach, are polarity lexicons. Um, what those guys, guys did is um, they had a, a small list of positive adjectives and, and they thought that every adjective connected with uh, that adjective in the list by and, which is coordination, um, will be um, necessarily a synonym so they decided to scrap the web and find, well, more manually, but they, uh, they found a lot of pairs of words connected by and, and so all the uh, words were added automatically to their uh, already, list, uh, already built list of positive words. They did the same with negative words with the, the, with the word but, or however, so they could uh, automatically um, have a, a bigger list of negative words. So this is a really good semi-supervised approach for this task because you get to, to have the best of both, like the unsupervised uh, is less time consuming and it's easier. This is a, an example from Dan Jurafsky's Stanford NLP course. This is a, a really good uh, book also. They have a, a book that they are editing right now. The, the third edition, I guess, is, is going to be uh, ready in a few months. And this is a really good course also for a lot of NLP tasks. And um, this is a really good approach so far I've, uh, I've seen so far. So um, The results are basically depending on the task you want to perform. Um, as I said before, uh, having tasks in NLP depends a lot on the text you have. I mean, if you are analyzing Twitter, you might need some strategies really different from the strategies you're going to use if you are analyzing, I don't know, a text in a novel. So this is a, a very important uh, thing you have to bear in mind because if your task is different, you're gonna need a to completely different strategy. Only also a, a very different algorithm. So k-means K -means is, is a good one for clustering if you have a, a bag of words and you need to you need to group them in clusters. But if you want to, to I don't know, uh, for instance, um, decide what, uh, in, in a spell corrector, if you want to know uh, if a grammar is uh, well written or not, I mean in a sentence, if you want to check the grammar, you might need a completely different approach and you might want to use n-grams or um, another strategy. So, um, uh, using the, the lexicons for sentiment recognition, uh, 
for me, is the best approach, I, as I said before. And we have prompts, like the topic discovery is a challenge. As, and if you already have a small set of words, it's really helpful, although you can um, uh, increase the amount of words automatically somehow. And also, uh, the performance is better. Almost always, I mean, all the cases I've seen, always the performance is better. On the contrary, um, mm, dynamic language is difficult. So it's really time consuming, um, building the lexicons and labeling the corpora. So, um, well, it depends on how, if you need to have a task uh, finished uh, in a small amount of time or you have more time, you can uh, use one strategy or another one. So this is the bibliography. Uh, I'm going to upload the slides in case you want to check. Uh, Mining Text Data is a really, really good book. Um, they have a lot of algorithms um, explained for each kind of task, so it's very useful. And just to finish, I'm from Mallorca. I'm a co-organizer of the Paideia, and I'm a computational linguist. I couldn't came up in the whole web with a proper definition of what a computational linguistic is. So I found this slide, which I think is awesome, and I decided to copy it here. I, you also have the information there. It's from a presentation. And uh, well, thank you very much for watching. <laughs> thank you, Olala, for that. We have a few minutes for questions. How do you determine your stop words? Is there a common set of words that tend to work, or is it based on your application? Well, basically anything without uh, lexical information would do. Like, for instance, uh, if you uh, have uh, the word house, you know that it might be uh, necessary to have the information of house, because you can find synonyms. Um, I don't know, you can find... Um, words that are related, such as, I don't know, the roof or whatever. But um, if you have, for instance, the determiner, it's, uh, it has no semantic meaning, which means that you cannot find uh, relative words, I mean, related words, sorry. So um, basically, this is what you take into account when uh, listing stop words. Also, it depends on your task. You might want to I don't know, decide that house in your case makes no sense in your bag of words, so you won't use it. So there are a list of subwords uh, which are already built, and you can, I know TK, for instance, the package has uh, some, and I know ma many packages have lists. But basically, this is the main principle of when deciding whether a word it is a subword uh, sub or not. No, you tokenize first, and then you remove whatever you don't like, usually. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering how you apply k-means to a bag of words. Like, there's, there must be a step in between, right? Well, uh, as I said before, I don't do a lot of modeling myself, but I usually prepare the, um, the data. So I know uh, the, the problem in that case with k-means was, uh, it, it made the, the, clus the clusters it were that w resulted from the first uh, task made no sense at all because, as I said in the example, you might you might have two words that are related because you know it, but uh, when it comes to clustering, somehow the algorithm doesn't find uh, similarities. So, um, I my my job was to decide how to improve. Um, the data so that the algorithm was better. I don't know exactly how they did implement the algorithm itself. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm not so much talking about k-means or anything, it's more like how you represent the data to an algorithm like k-means, because you, like usually you have a set of uh, vectors and then you compare the vectors, if this makes sense to you. And it's, it's difficult, like you need to encode the word into something that is uh, meaningful for a machine, right? Yeah, but, um, yeah, I understand, but um, 
I don't code the algorithm, so I don't know if they did a step in the in the middle. I mean, I know I have the uh, I have a set of uh, data, a list of words in that case, and uh, I had the results, and I saw that uh, the clusters made no sense. And uh, I had to come up with a solution on how to improve those clusters. So uh, from a linguistic point of view, uh, I saw that uh, words that should be related were not related at all. So I, I started uh, reading um, a couple of articles and I found out that um, the, the problem with k-means, for instance, is that you need somehow information that relates the words. And this was missing. So this is why um, I was saying that if you use uh, another uh, resource like Wikipedia, mm -hmm. you can somehow find relations between the words. But uh, I'm, I'm not coding the k-means algorithm in okay. this case. Okay, so. thank you. Another question? Hi, uh, Hi, thanks for the talk. So uh, these days on social media especially, uh, if I'm trying to measure sentiment, mm -hmm. uh, what I see is that a lot of people respond or review uh, with emojis or they would use uh, sarcasm or they would just react with like a gif of something that they're feeling. So when you're preparing data to, uh, to measure sentiment, for example, do you take these things into account somehow? Yeah, of course. Um, it's it's really difficult. Uh, it is um, I mean, most of the times you want to remove all the noise you can. So uh, when it comes to sarcasm, and you find that some words uh, are really not helping and are noise, you basically remove them. Um, also, you can try to do a. Um, another analysis, which is deeper uh, linguistically, I mean, and you try to label everything, and um, with this you improve a lot, but it takes a lot of time. It's time consuming, and, and also um, you need a lot of people working in that. You need a lot of people labeling the data and helping so, with uh, the task. Like you have uh, stop lists of stopped words, there's no such resource out there where you can say, okay, this emoji reflects this emotion and it's no. positive or negative? No. Okay. Thank you. Well, not that I know, but um, so far I, I never found a list. So, so you mentioned one of the difficulty is to decide if you split the combination uh, of words. So in your practical, practical like, uh, experience, what kind of like metrics you may, you use to determine if you need to split or not. You do it manually, or you use a rules. Like a, what kind of rules? Well, you can um, you can use. I mean, of course, you can use algorithms and try to to do it automatically. And um, I mean, you can get good results. But if you want to be really really uh, specific and. Uh, make sure that uh, all the words are um, the way you want them to be. Uh, you usually can build a dictionary or um, you can use... Oh, sorry, uh, my question is like, how do you determine if you want to split or not? This is uh, depending on what you want to do, I mean the task. Uh, if you want to, uh, I don't know, if, if you uh, need the, the names of people, you might want to focus on that task uh, specifically, and then you perform that task uh, better, and then uh, you find, um, I mean, I usually work with lists because the task I did uh, was, uh, I mean, you needed a specific words to be found, and without no other um, interference or so, but uh, I mean, I don't like doing it this way. You know, uh, th there's many ways you can do it better. Uh, I mean, I'm a linguist, and my and my job is um, to solve the problems that the algorithms uh, cannot solve. So, uh, 
my job is not so good as, I mean, it's not that um, cool as writing code and everything works perfectly. I need to find the bugs and resolve them, which is the problem uh, with the algorithms, which are obviously much fun, <laughs> but I, I work with, with lists or with rules like um, regular expressions or okay. whatever I can. Okay, thank you. Basically. Uh, we are run out of time for questions already, so let's thank Olalia once again for the talk. Thank you.